please be seated. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24. 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up aloft where he abode and laid upon him on his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon thy widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, now, by this, I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Amen. Amen. Before we get into the sermon this morning, I want to draw your attention to an uh, email that uh, came from Christian Family Coalition. And I think uh, most all of you in the congregation, you've already received this email. It's in regards to uh, a decision that is left now to the courts. And that is that decision is whether or not Florida's constitutional right to privacy is being violated by um, DeSantis 15 week ban on abortion. So as you look at the screen, the, the wording is up there. Uh, there's the section where it uh, points this out to us, Let's see if we can uh, get this, that um, the right to abortion last year by striking down Roe versus Wade, pro-abortion extremists claim the Florida's constitutional right to privacy continues to protect the so-called right to kill pre-born children in Florida. So if we scroll up, just scroll down a little bit more, the state, the state presented clear evidence that Florida's constitutional right to privacy never intended as a license to kill innocent babies in the womb. We're asking everyone to pray that the justice will make the right decision and save countless lives in Florida. So part of the way that you could be part of this in helping the justices understand is in the form of a petition that can only be gathered online. So as the soundboard brings that petition forward, you would be asked to uh, fill in that form that you see on the screen and your name, your address, et cetera. It will, for registration purposes, it will require your birth date or your voter registration card down at the bottom. And then at the bottom of that, there'll be an icon to hit print. This is where you have to understand what is going on. Once you hit print and you send it to your printer, it will print out a form that looks like this. This is a petition. And at the very top of it, it will say the ballot title, Human Life Protection Amendment, an amendment recognizing the God-given right to life of the pre-born individual, defines pre-born individual as a pre-born human person at any stage of development, affirms that life-saving procedures to save the life of the mother shall not be construed as a violation when accompanied by reasonable steps to save the life of the pre-born individual, to be added to the Declaration of Rights under Article I of the Florida Constitution. So everything that you put on that little box will be printed out in eight and a half by 11. So the only way this works, when you fill it out online, print it out, and then the address, the mailing address, is given to us uh, on this form. If you cannot make it to the post office, if you bring the printed form to our office, uh, bring it in tonight if you want, we will make sure that it gets an envelope, it gets a stamp, 
and it, it goes out. It doesn't have to happen all at once. So uh, i giving you the opportunity to participate in a form of government. If you remember last Sunday evening, we watched that uh, sermon by Eric Metaxas, it, whereby he wrote the book, Letters to the American Church, reflecting upon Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, bringing the parallels between German history and their non, uh, the Lutheran Church, non-involvement in government, which ended up in a uh, Nazi regime taking over Germany and imprisoning many of the churches. We don't want to see that happening in America. So every opportunity that we have to voice biblical values to government and to law seize the opportunity. And so uh, uh, it is an encouragement to all of us to participate in this, it's a whole lot easier now, but um, read the email, print the form, fill it out, print the form, send it or bring it in and we'll make sure that it goes in. So having said that, um, uh, uh, just ask once again that you see, take this, take this seriously. Thank Charlie for doing the reading of the scriptures there this morning out of 1 Kings chapter 17 in our text, which when we read the text, the highlight of it is that of Elijah's prayer over the dead child, and we see the child coming back to life. So what we're interested in this morning is learning to pray like Elijah. There are numerous accounts of men that have prayed throughout the Bible. Herbert Lockyer writes a, a book of about 300 pages where he gives a very brief commentary on the variety of, of prayers that are uh, recorded for us in the Bible, and they're there for our edification, for our admonition that we might learn from them. And such as it is that in these few verses, actually two verses, give to us, Eli three verses, give to us Elijah's prayer and the remarkable results that started out of that. And we want to give some attention to the different points or the aspects of his prayer this morning. Before we do that, let's pray and ask God to use his word to illuminate our hearts and to encourage us to be, have the prayer fervency in the faith of Elijah. And so, Father, we have before us the very words of life recorded, preserved, kept for our instruction they are our life. Help us, Father, to take them seriously. And as we hear those words, we ask that the Holy Spirit would be the preacher. He'd be the one that would open up hearts of all of us to hear these, this prayer of Elijah and make it part of the fabric of our own prayer life, that we could be able to see uh, the Elijah results. We may not be able to raise an individual from the dead, but we can see mighty works of God take place. And so teach us this day your ways, your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I was young, way back when, in high school, more like seventh and eighth grade, I picked up a book by, uh, on a life story of uh, uh, Cunningham, Glenn Cunningham. Connie Huntingham was a young boy at age eight, back in the days of 1917, when the one woman schoolhouse was heated by a stove. And this is uh, Glenn and his brother Floyd were given the responsibility of coming into the schoolhouse early in the morning and starting the little coal furnace, potbelly stove, and uh, making it warm for the rest of the class. Somebody inadvertently had replaced the kerosene or mixed gasoline in with the kerosene. And so when Floyd and his brother threw the match into uh, the coal with saturated with this gas oil mix, the explosion took place. Floyd died in the accident, but Glenn suffered severe burns, so much so that at age eight, he was in horrific pain and the doctors decided the best thing they could do was do amputation of his legs. They were so severely burned. But he objected to it, his parents objected to it, and just out of sure willpower, perseverance, and prayer, Glenn Cunningham would turn out to be one of the 
uh, premier milers, runners, mile runners of the 1930s. He was nicknamed the Kansas Flyer in 1936 at the Olympics. He won a silver medal in, in the 1500 uh, meter race in the 1936 Olympics, and he set numerous world records on what would be called mid-distance running. He broke the world record for the mile in the Berlin Olympics, and that was, uh, wasn't until the days of uh, a, a Bannister uh, that that record was broken once again. Now that record's down around three minutes and 48 seconds to run a mile. But the point of that discussion is, I read that book, and it was a huge inspiration in my life. The man's perseverance, the ability to be able to run, and I was involved in track at that time. So my little episode in life, my high school was out in the country, I set a track record. Uh, back then, it was a record, it was four minutes and 10 seconds for, for the mile. Then my brother comes along and he has to beat it. Then somebody else comes along, and of course the number will always go down, we know this. But I was inspired by this man who suffered such severe burns and within four years, at age 12, he's running and through perseverance and, and determination, he was able to set records in his local high school at age 12 in his, uh, after that accident. Why do I bring that up? Because the, I was inspired by this one man's perseverance and it became an aspiration in my life to be able to run like Glenn Cunningham could run. And so, I practiced, and I practiced hard. Now in Pennsylvania, where we live, there are no flat areas. The only flat area is that's at the bottom of a valley and the water of a stream. After that, it's all uphill or downhill. And so my day, my weekend, sometimes in preparing for track season, was just running uh, over the hills through the orchard, just gaining that Glenn Cunningham ability to run and set another record. You see, when we look at uh, individuals in the Bible, and we see uh, wonderful feats that they've accomplished. In this case, Elijah bringing a dead child back to life. It should serve as an inspiration to us that we would want to be able to do something equal to or more than what Elijah did by his prayer life. It would be the disciples in Luke chapter 11 who were witnessing Jesus as he prayed. And they saw something different in Jesus' prayer that provoked the question to them, Lord, can you teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray? In other words, they saw that there was something lacking in their own prayer life, and as a result of that, the testimony of Jesus, they requested prayer lessons. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus would honor that. Luke records it in brief, uh, like with a bullet point outline, but then you go to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus uh, expands upon the whole uh, idea of prayer and, and the exercise. And so when we look at the disciples, how they desire to play like Jesus, and we look at Elijah, James teaches us that Elijah was a man of like passions like we are. Was an, uh, was, he dealt with uh, the struggles that we struggle with, but yet, he the, was a man of effectual, fervent prayer. And it records probably one of the, the, the greatest events uh, of history that in six months of prayer time, he asked the Lord to stop the rain so that Israel could suffer the consequences and it would not rain till after the passing of three years. And when he prayed again, the earth would receive the rain from heaven. Who prays like that? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we're going to stop the weather, or we're going to bring somebody back from the dead, but what we can do is we can emulate the, the perseverance, the fervency, the, the idea of alone with God, the claiming of promise. We can emulate that, and that can become part of our prayer vocabulary. It should become part of our heart. So, what does it take to see Elijah results, or we might say Elijah-like results in our day? Let's take our nation, for example. What does it take for America, for the church in America, to get turned around? 
so that it be stop worshiping its own individual idols that the American people as a nation would, would end the, the relentless pursuit of death and confusion. What does it take to bring an end to that and a revival and a restoration? Just as it was for Elijah. He saw what was happening in in Israel, and he was moved by the radical apostasy to the extent that they would forsake their covenant relationship with God. We are no longer your children, and also to destroy everything that represented God. They would kill the prophets. There is your first gag order in the history of humanity. They killed the prophets, and then they destroyed the altars. Anything that spoke of God, referred to God, was destroyed. Why? Because of Baalism. And Elijah saw that and it broke his heart. He, we're told in chapter 18 that he was jealous for the Lord God of Israel. Obadiah was a man that was feared God from his youth. And so these men would stand firm. And for Elijah, he is highlighted in the scriptures because as a result of, of that kind of passionate desire for God's glory, he, the results of what he did are recorded for us to read. So it takes, number one, an Elijah heart. Just by way of uh, introduction, you have to have a heart of Elijah. It's one thing to learn how to pray. You can study Matthew chapter 6, Luke chapter 11. You can study this. You can look at wonderful prayers given to us by Moses, by Nehemiah, and Ezra. Great prayers. Outlines are there. Examples are there. But if we don't have a heart for the results, that's what makes the difference. And in this case, we see that Elijah was a man that prayed with God-oriented results in mind. He wanted to see that which would please the Lord the most be that which he would pray for. So it takes praying for God-oriented results. What's that look like? It looks like praying for the salvation of individuals that are lost. It could be the ones that are closest to it. It could be that you're praying for somebody that on the prayer sheet. But with the the passion and the fervency of Elijah. Why? Because you desire to see God honored when an individual calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. God is honored because Jesus died for that individual's sin, and God can rescue and save him. It would be uh, praying for people to be more dependent upon God and less dependent upon themselves or their finances or the world around them, a a, a dependence, an eagerness to enjoy God's benefits, praying as God-oriented results that we would worship properly, that it would not be man-centered worship, but God-centered worship, faithfulness within the church, faithfulness within the family, faithfulness to, of men to be faithful to their employers. I'm not going to go to the strike, the union strike, leave that out. But that's a lack of faithfulness. That is a self-centered desires for 30 to 40 percent more income with only 32 hours of work. Anybody want to give me that kind of a break? I'll not go on strike. But that's where we're at today. We want more, and we want to work less for it. So God-oriented prayer looks for uh, people to, to be faithful to their commissioning, to their role. That's Elijah. And that's what we want to see. But you, got, you have to start with God first. Prayer results can only be so that God is honored, God is glorified, and people turn toward him. Elijah never wrote a book. Elijah never said, here's how to pray. He just went about his life because he was solely interested in, I am jealous for the Lord God because they've rejected you, your prophets, and your altars. So, We might say in conclusion to the introduction, how about that? It starts with our own heart. Before you even entertain the idea, I want to pray like Elijah, it starts with our own heart. 
Do we really want to pray that way? It takes work. Do we really want to see God work through us? That's the kind of heart. You've got to start there. Even if Jesus come in and teach us to pray, if you don't have that kind of passionate desire, then it's to no avail. It's academics. Academics. So the, this word has to be attached to our heart. So the next two Sundays, today and next week, uh, we want to look at these seven points, seven aspects of Elijah's prayer in this upper room over this dead corpse and God answering, hearing those words in verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Why would God entertain us? There's a whole lot to be said. I just want to give you the list and we'll look at three of them. So quit just briefly. We find that Elijah goes to private quarters he takes the child and he goes upstairs to his place where he abode. We find his fervency, O oh Lord, my God. So there's energy in his prayer. He sees something serious. He, he uh, prays according to his covenant relationship. O oh Lord, my God. He knows that he belongs to God. Jehovah is his savior, his rescue. He's encouraged by God's attributes. You've brought suffering onto this family. He's not criticizing God. He's recognizing that God has sovereign power in one of his attributes. And so he's encouraged by the fact that this wasn't an accident. This is of God. His persistence bring the child's soul back to him. And it's uh, where he, he lays upon the body of the child. He appeals to God's mercy for this widow with whom I sojourn, and she is taking care of me. And he gives a definite petition. Please restore the soul to the child. So in those things, there's something to be said about each one of them. We want to make it so that we can associate them with the New Testament uh, teaching on the same subject. So let's begin with a place to seek God. Now, when you read this, the first thing that should come to your mind is what? When Jesus taught the disciples, what did he give them instructions to do? And when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door. Jesus first, level one, num bullet point number one, before you do anything, Go private. Close the door. And so this is what we see Elijah doing. If you're going to have fervency, you cannot have distractions. If there's going to be passion, there cannot be distractions. And so the place to seek God is our first article that we look at, his private quarters up in the loft. It's a place to seek God. And so he goes up there, and we notice that he, he, uh, he shuts the door. He's excluded. He's all by himself. You see, this is why I had Charlie read Psalm 91. He's going to that private place, that secret place. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that. Alone with God, seen only by God. There's no public reward, no public recognition as the Pharisees would in their day. But in Psalm 91, we find that here's a good place to start. Reading this psalm and entering into a season of prayer, asking God to give us privacy. I got to think about this last night. Was to, to be able to have the privacy that we really want. We might be able to shut off our phones. We might be able to have for example, uh, we, we took a day, we went up to build bags, and we had, we had five miles of beach to ourselves. And all you could hear, you're sitting there, the gentle breeze and the lapping of the water. There are zero other distractions. Every once in a while, an airliner would go ahead, but there were nobody, nothing. And so you can do all that, but here's the real problem. It's so difficult to shut off the brain. That is going to be our biggest distraction. It won't be your phone. It won't be the book. It's not necessarily, in my case, I had to put Remy outside if I really want to have any time to get anything done. We, we can eliminate all those things, but you can't stop your brain. So what do we do? 
Psalm 91 puts us in a position, a spiritual position, to dwell in the secret place of the Most High, to hide in the secret place, to find safety in this secret place, to find confidence in God's secret place. You notice each one of those are there. We dwell, you abide. We find shelter there. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge, my protection, a place of confidence in God. In him will I trust. And introducing ourselves to our prayer time by such a psalm as this, to putting us in that place where our mind now begins to think of the heavenly things. It won't stop, but we can have something to say about what it reflects on. And so the more determined we are, the more scripture that we enter into the prayer closet with, and then having the list that you can read over it, taking into consideration, again, it's bringing the mind under the discipline of the word. But it, that's all part of going to a place whereby we can seek God. This is not new in the Bible. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, after the decree was signed, Daniel's one of the presidents, by the way, and Osiris, the new king, comes on board, and we're told that, that Daniel, as one of the presidents of the king's men, high office position. But as you'll notice when you read that text from verses 1 to 10, and uh, because he would have had first-hand notice of all documents and uh, ordinances that were going to be signed, the decrees, we read this. Daniel knew the decree was signed. He went up and he prayed in his chamber toward Jerusalem with the open window, not to be seen of men. That was the style, that was the practice. It was facing toward Jerusalem. And here we find, as he did before. So even Daniel demonstrated the place, the secret place, the quiet place. And in his situation, he knew that he was going to be first on the list because he would not bow down and recognize the king as a god. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 9, we read in that occasion in chapter 10, Cornelius receives a vision from God and uh, because Cornelius was a righteous man, and he loved God's people, and he loved the Lord, and he, and he gave to the synagogue. And so in that, God honors that zeal to want to know Jesus, and he informs him, send men to, uh, uh, to find Simon Peter, and I'll tell you exactly where you're going to find him, Simon the Tanner. And so Cornelius takes his best soldiers and a very faithful lieutenant, and he dispatches them, and they find Peter up on the roof. And as they were on, these men of Cornelius are on the way. The Bible records for us in verse 9, as they were on their way, Peter went up to the rooftop of the house to pray. Another habit, more than likely, is that which Peter had. And during that prayer time, God invites him into the Cornelius life because he invites him by means of the sheep, of all manner of unclean things, and he says, you sit down and you eat dinner. And Peter objects. The world, the world word tells me what is unclean, I am not. And God says, what I've declared to be clean, that's what you will eat. So the Gentiles are now clean, and they can receive the gospel. You can sit down and have lunch. You can have dinner with a Gentile because Cornelius' group were on their way, and we know the rest of the story. These were men that went to private places to prayer. Jesus retired into the garden. Then just several nights prior, the night before his uh, uh, suffering, his agony on the cross, we find him at, at Gethsemane praying, and he invites the disciples to pray with him. So these are the place, the secret place, where we, whereby we come alone with God. It's critical. It's difficult. It's hard to do. It takes discipline. It takes an effort. And before we can be inspired and have that as an aspiration, there must be first the heart, the Elijah heart. Lord, I am jealous for God's people. They have destroyed your oldest. They put gag orders on the prophets. And Father, what can you do? And that kind of a heart is what brings about then the aspiration and the inspiration that 
or given to us by Elijah. Secondly, praying with intensity. And he cried unto the Lord. You read throughout the Bible, if you, want, if you do a brief study, to our key in that phrase, cried unto the Lord. In each one of those situations, there's something desperate that is taking place where the individual needs an immediate answer. Something is happening that requires and needs God's help. And so that expression of this cried unto the Lord is the expression of fervency, energy, uh, intensity. And that's what we look at now, praying with intensity. Elijah teaches us that there, need, there must be times whereby the intensity level rises above the norm, the average prayer. For example, in this situation, we look at the occasion of his prayer. Here was a man that God sent him to take care of the widow and their son. I have commanded the widow to sustain thee. And so Elijah sends her to bring the food, the oil, with the promise that the oil will not fail, neither will the meal. And they lived that way for maybe for about, who knows, maybe it was a year. And so there's this domestic life that is beginning to grow on Elijah. And as this is all taking place, suddenly, out of nowhere, we read in the text that the child dies. So in chapter uh, 17, verse 17, it came to pass after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. His sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. It took only one verse to say this, that suddenly the boy is fine, he gets very sick, and within a short moment of time, he's dead. He's just there. And so the widow cries out to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Did you come unto me to call my sin to remembrance? And as a result of that, to cast judgment upon me by slaying my son? And when you look at what happens next, and he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took the son out of her bosom. She's probably holding the child like this. The compassion that he had for her, even though she's blasting him and accusing him of their son's death. Nevertheless, the compassion that he had, the occasion was one that would require this intensity, this fervency. This was serious. She lost her one and only. He saw the heartbreak. He probably also recognized that here's a widow woman that she has in the past year come face to face with the glory of God, the meal and the oil every morning replenished, just like the mercies of God, fresh and anew every day. And so she witnessed that. And then there is the guilt because there was her past. And in, in her mind, there's the part of her sorrow, she's torn between the, the guilt of her past sins, that God very well could be judging her, whatever they were, they came to her heart immediately, she has to deal with that, and then she loses her child. The loss of a very part of her being is taken away from her. And as Elijah, this man, stern as he was, but yet so gentle, he takes the child very carefully and he goes upstairs to his private quarters and the occasion was the personal suffering that the widow was going through. The emotional affection that uh, Elijah demonstrates for this mother. You see, there are times when we run into those kind of situations and it's not always a death situation. There are times where maybe it's a the bad news of a doctor's report or the, the urgency of, a, of a, a financial rescue. There's something about the situation, the occasion that calls for more than just the, a simple, Lord, bless our day. Or remember these bullet points that I have. We have to spend time. Some things take more time, more energy. 
Now, I'm not here to give you a lesson what fervency looks like, but we can tell by reading of the different uh, fervent prayers of men in the Bible, there's the, the words indicate energy. The vocabulary speaks of earnestness and a desire to see God act and come to work right away. See, also in his intensity, her sorrow, her guilt merge together. She struggles with this. I would say also that here's an occasion whereby her faith was being tested. Elijah was a man of faith. So he's not going to dispense with, uh, this is odd, that here's a God working. and He's not going to throw out the faith, what is God doing element, and just look at the emotional and the physical and the dead child. Elijah was a, a man of faith. He had the, the like passion, but he also kept his mind alert. God is up to something. What is he doing? And I believe he was... God was working not only with Elijah to put him in a situation whereby he was being prepared for greater things through this hardship, but he's also testing the faith of the widow. One might ask, where does the Bible say that she had faith and that she would believe that her child could be brought back? I mean, after all, Elijah dwelt with her. She saw this miracle taking place every day. Certainly her faith is going to grow and she would share that faith, that trust, and have it renewed and refreshed each day. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a, a J. Wallace on you, who the cold case Christianity, whereby he, you take what seems to be an abstract text of scripture and he makes the connection to the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35. What is Hebrews chapter 11? But it's the great faith chapter. And in verse 35, we read these words. Women receive their dead raised to life again. Now, what is all this? This is all about faith. Every one of these episodes in here have something to do with active faith. And in this verse, what is highlighted? Women received their dead raised to life again. What are the occasions whereby in the Old Testament where this is where we're reading about women, plural, received their dead back to life? Elijah with the widow and Elisha with the Shumanite son. In both situations, these are the occasions whereby when you read the context, there is not a an exaggeration of their faith, except for the Shumanite widow. She demonstrates her faith a little bit more clearly. But the widow at Zarephath, we would say, I don't see an ounce of faith in that lady. Nor would we find any faith in Sarah, for that matter. But yet she's put in as one of the, the in the chronicles of faith for those that trusted God. And so because through faith, women received their dead raised again to life, it indicates to us that there was the measure of faith that God saw in her, that Elijah saw in her, and God in his infinite wisdom is going to test her faith. Will she really believe God that he can raise this child from the dead? You say that's a stretch. Well, you take that up with the author of Hebrews. If the Bible tells me that she was one of the women, there were only two occasions in the Bible whereby a child is resurrected, one by Elijah, one by Elisha. After that, we don't have it. And here they are listed as faith heroes. And the widow at Zarephath was one of them. Is God going to test our faith? Might he take something from us that we enjoy that is ours? There are numerous ways in which God could do it. And in this case, the occasion, the praying with intensity, would also serve not only to be a comfort to her, but to answer her faith question. I believe that Elijah was ministering to this widow as, he had, as we can minister to other people that are going through hardships and difficulties. And we could say, we can pray together. In faith believing, 
we have the confidence in him that what we ask of him, he hears us, as John says in 1 John chapter 5, because we have faith, we have confidence in him. And so the occasion was the death of the child. The occasion was to was excite the faith and, and test and prove the faith of, of the widow. We might say also that in this intensity, in this fervency, God was pruning the widow's life as well as his. She's a believer by now. And God treats all of his children what? To bring everybody to the image of his son. And so she's developing, he's, God's developing godliness in her life. And what better way to do it than through this horrific time of suffering, but then the earnest, fervent prayers of a man who is alone with God and crying out to the Lord with energy. Some situations require more fervency than others. Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah fasted and prayed for three days and he wept. Elisha, and when the Shumanite woman chases Elisha down, finds him where he's at, Elisha dispatches Gehazi, take my crook, my cane, and lay it on the child. Now I said that when you read, the, read that text, it's in... Uh, 2 Kings, and uh, chapter, I forget what the address is. But she did not bury her son immediately. She took the child, the Shumanite woman takes her child, and puts it in Elisha's quarters. And it would be about another two to three days before they get back. She believed that God could bring that child back up through the prophet Elisha. But the point of it is, Elisha, we don't see an earnestness like we did with Elijah at the, at the first. Prayers of benediction. We have prayers of, for discouraged hearts. There are prayers in the Bibles for new leaders. Prayers of inquiry as David would inquire of the Lord, should I fight the Philistines or should I not? There are prayers for direction as Paul and Silas and the missionaries would ask God for directions in Macedonia. He said, not some are more earnest, where we find they, they cried out to the Lord, or, and David inquired of the Lord. And so the situation dictates the, the earnestness, but still, there's an element of fervency. Lord, we, I want to, we want to see you work. Third observation this morning is the proclaiming my relationship with God. Not only do we pray with intensity, but we find that Elisha prays with based on the merits of his relationship with with God himself O Lord my God that one phrase declares his covenant relationship with Jehovah and on the grounds of that covenant relationship will you as we look at our text and he says this O Lord my God you have also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son and he stretched himself on, on the son, in verse 21, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come in unto him again. O Lord my God, I have a relationship with you. I am one of yours. You've established this covenant promise because I am an Israelite. I am one of your chosen ones. I am your prophet. I am the one that you sent here. And all of those uh, grounds for why God should help him. It's interesting, Krumacher makes an observation when he looks at this prayer, when we stand back and kind of just read it, we almost get the idea that Elijah's being presumptuous. He's just rattling off whatever serious words that he can have and asking God to do so much. Look at me, I'm one of yours. But Krumacher points out that God does not look at our prayer wording the way we look at it. We may say that was obnoxious, but God says, I hear privacy. I hear intensity. I hear covenant relationship. I hear a man that knows that he is one of mine. And on the, on the grounds of that relationship, 
God answers, and the Lord heard Elijah's prayer. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he told them to do what? When you pray, pray in this manner, our Father who art in heaven. On the basis of who you are in respect to God, as a believer, you become a child of God. So in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, when you read that text, we find that uh, Paul writes and says, we have received, through the Holy Spirit, we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Unheard of in the Jewish lexicon to be able to have those words, Abba, Father, because God was the father of Israel, not of the individual, with a few exceptions. That was their theology. And now Paul writes, and he's copying Gentile vocabulary, because that was the language of the, of, of the Roman, the Greek literature. We cry, Daddy, Daddy, intensity. It's an intense, in, uh, intimate relationship. And so we have this spirit of adoption. We cry, Abba, Father. And the same spirit testifies that we are the child of God. So in our prayer, alone with God, with fervency for given situations, we appeal to God as one of his children. We appeal to him. Now listen, you, I became your child because Christ, your son, died for me. So the price, the premium that was paid to be in this position as being adopted and be declared the, a, a, a child of Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good measure of his will. You see, when we pray, we can say, honestly, we can say to God without, without being irrational about it, we say, Father, I'm one of your children. Jesus paid the price so that I could be, it's almost say, like, Lord, honor your son. Honor his death for my redemption. I'm now your child. And God delights to hear his children as the maid looks up to the to the master for provision, as creation looks up to God for its provision. The psalmist tells us, so God's people look up and they pray and they plead of God. Because now God is honored because one of his own children are coming to him and requesting his immediate action or assistance. So, summarize that. We appeal to God to answer prayer based upon our sonship. We are declared to be the children of God. That essentially is what Elijah was doing, except for Elijah in his economy of theology, it was his covenant relationship. God chose them, God chose him. And based on that, Elijah could say, look, I am one of your chosen ones, and therefore, I'm coming to you because of that relationship that you built, that you established, it's according to your promise, your covenant. And so he appeals, he prays, oh Lord, my God. Let me just wrap this up. There's a very important point that we have to make here in all of this. And that is this. Praying like Elijah is only for believers. You just make a note of that. In God's world, there are two distinct classes of family. There are two distinct families, if you will, two distinct individuals. You are either a child of the king, child of God, adopted into the family, declared, testified to be children of God, predestinated to be adopted into God's family by Jesus Christ to himself. That's where you should be. Meaning that there has been in your life the exercise of faith whereby you prayed the one prayer that God will always answer to all creation, Lord, 
save me. He are ushered in by faith in Jesus Christ because he died on your behalf. You become that child of God. That's the group you want to be in. But then, in Ephesians, we also read that we are in our former days before salvation. This is the other group, the other class. Children of disobedience. The children of wrath. Where in times past, you walked according to the lust of the flesh and the desires of your heart as children of disobedience. Jesus would tell the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. So unsaved individuals, mark this, I'm not being rude. You have a parent. Without Jesus Christ, you have a parent. And Satan is your father, spiritually speaking. When we are saved, we are rescued from that kingdom of darkness, from that childhood of disobedience, and we're brought over into the kingdom of God's dear son, and now we become a child of God, children of God, adopted. We have the Holy Spirit that testifies and confirms it. So, praying like Elijah means that we have to be saved. Real simple. You must be born again. Now, somebody's going to say, well, listen, I've never trusted Jesus, but I know that God answers my prayers. And I will say, that's true. You have not maybe trusted Jesus, and yes, God has answered your prayers. But why? Is the answer to a prayer a mark, the fact that God loves you enough that you can bypass the cross and be one of his children simply because he answered your prayer? Or could it possibly be another reason? That God has what is known as a common grace. He sheds his kindness on the just, saved, righteous, and the unjust, those that reject God. He still pours out some kind of a blessing. The rain falls in both parties. Ahab was a man that was informed by Elijah, all your children are going to die. Nobody will survive you. Elijah has a nervous breakdown and a period of repentance, and he cried out unto God and sorrowfully mourning in ashes and sackcloth because he did not want to see death upon his family. The worst king of Israel, the Bible records him that way. And guess what God did? God answered his prayer. Elijah Go back to Ahab, and you tell him that his life is spared, that his children's life are, have been spared. I will not carry out the prophecy that I said would happen. So Elijah was given a glimpse of God's mercy. In the end, he still rejected it. But nevertheless, unsaved man despised God and God's people, God answered his prayer. So, God answers prayers of people in general, yes, for a specific reason. The goodness of God is what leads men to the cross. So, be saved and pray. If you're not saved, pray so that you can see God trying to convince you. But don't expect the big ones. Don't expect to have a heart like of Elijah, because as a children of wrath, as a child of disobedience, you're, you're, it's like praying to your neighbor's dad when you're a kid. Hey, can you get this for me? Can you do this for me? I mean, you do it for my friend here. No, you're not part of my family. That's what it's like. So bear in mind, the prayer of Elijah belongs to Christianity, believers in Jesus Christ. The prayer of Ahab belongs to those that are without Christ, that every once in a while God will answer only to inform you, I have mercy, and appeal to that mercy and come to know Jesus. So, Father, we thank you that Elijah gives to us some wonderful lessons. We would ask that our hearts would have his heart to be concerned, gravely, deeply concerned for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the commission of the church, the, uh, the state of our nation, 
And Father, for those that are without Christ, those that are lost, we ask that uh, we be able to have the same fire and passion, quiet time with God, make the arrangements to quiet our minds and focus on you, and appeal to the family relationship that comes through Jesus. Help each one individual here today to examine that we would examine our own hearts for our soul's sake, our salvation, or that, Father, for our prayer life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.